Last week we talked about the ignorant wickedness, how the soldiers simply mocked at Jesus, sneered at him, gave him all kinds of punches, they spit on him, they did all this ignorantly. We call this the ignorant wickedness. Maybe some of you are sitting here this morning, you are mocking Jesus, you despise Jesus, you are here because maybe your friend asked you to come, some of you viewing us online, maybe you despise Christ, and you go along with your friends that also mock Christ, but you do so in ignorance, out of ignorance, even though your ignorance will not exempt you from the judgment and the wrath of God, it is nevertheless wickedness on your part that came out as a result of ignorance. I came across a little message of a couple who lived in Minnesota that wanted to go out on a vacation to Florida. And because of their busy schedule, husband and wife could not get the plane tickets at the same time so the husband ended up going to Florida first and the wife was supposed to arrive the next day when the husband got to Florida to this hotel that they had spent their honeymoon 20 years ago he went into the room and found a computer so he wanted to write his wife a little note but he accidentally mistyped one of the letters to her email address so he went to someone else Meanwhile, a woman in Houston, she just came home from her husband's funeral, a Baptist minister who had just suddenly passed and went into glory because of a heart attack. She opened her email, hoping to find some letters and notes of condolences and so on, only to find this letter, this email. And she, after reading it, screamed and fainted. The son rushed into her room, found her on the ground. The computer opened, and he read this, the following. To my loving wife. Subject, I've just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. (laughs) That was done ignorantly. That was done by mistake. But what horrible, terrible note to find that her husband who passed, is writing her an email saying it's hot down here. That was a scary, scary note. It would be scary to anyone. And things happen ignorantly all the time. How often do we sin knowingly? How often do we sin unknowingly? We sin all the time without even thinking. We sin all the time willfully. We sin all the time knowingly. But like these soldiers who despised Christ, not out of hate, mind you. They were doing their business. They were doing their work. They were doing their job. But nevertheless, they were crucifying Jesus, not just on the cross, but on the way to the cross with all of their harsh words, beating him, punching him, ridiculing him. We talked about that as the ignorant Wickedness. For thousands of years, wickedness had been growing, rousing the fiery thunderbolts of retribution of God. Now grown to full maturity, people are standing around the cross in such gigantic proportions. This ignorance, this fiery darts thrown at Jesus the mightiest exploits dwindle into insignificance and pale into dimness what they, the soldiers, have done to Jesus on the way to the cross and even while on the cross all the way through. 
They cannot just kill him. They must blaspheme, defame, punch, slap, spit, stab all the way. Such cruelty of the human heart fully exposed. There's no greater wickedness depicted than such evil as we see here in this chapter. Jesus suffered more sorrow than any, more than sorrows combined, because we are told in the book of Isaiah 53, allow me to read verses 2 and 3, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was known as the man of sorrows because he was so familiar with grief. He was in grief all throughout his life. We never see him in the New Testament smiling. There is no depiction of him smiling, cracking a joke, but we see him always mourning, grieving, a man of sorrows. How did he suffer? Let me suggest to you a few things. From self-denial, he suffered. Self-denial. He refused to have things we assume to be the normal comforts of life. He refused these things. Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. He was born in a manger. He had deprived himself of food. He was always weary, tired, fatigued. He not only suffered from self-denial, he suffered from temptation. In all points was he tempted as we are. He was assaulted all the time. He was blasphemed, despised, falsely accused, mocked. Now reaching a culmination of fury, he is experiencing so much pain and suffering. He also suffered from Satan. Satan threw all he had. All hell could break loose upon his head, but the Bible tells us in Genesis that he could only bruise his heel. Satan threw at him everything that he could, but he only ended up bruising Christ's heel. From sin, though Christ was sinless, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, he became sin for us. He was suffering from self-denial, from temptation and from Satan, and he also suffered from sin itself. As I said a moment ago, even though he was sinless, he became sin for us. So he had all this suffering on top of people's ridicule, and all that people threw at him, he suffered all the way to the cross. But Matthew just simply passes over the crucifixion without any explanation. He simply says, after he was crucified, and he goes on. In the literal original text, it says, having crucified now him, they divided the garments of him. It is almost as though it was an insignificant, it just is nothing. Matthew does not highlight the details of the crucifixion. We have to get it from the other gospels. The cross would be lying on the ground, Victim placed down on the cross, feet extended, toes pulled down, a large nail driven through the arch of one foot, then the next foot. Hands would be extended, allowing his knees to flex. Great nails driven through wrists. And once upon being nailed, the cross picked up and dropped into a hole, flesh ripped, pains exploding. Beginning to sag down, more weight placed upon the nails, fiery pain shooting up the arms. Trying to relieve pain, pushes up two wounded feet, back and forth, back and forth, till it is impossible to push up. Great waves of cramps sweep over the arm muscles, relentless throbbing pain, hanging by arms, pectoral muscles paralyzed, unable to act, air drawn in but can't exhale. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs, hours of limitless pain eventually killing Christ. Not to mention the open back flesh moving up and down the rough timber, 
chest crushed, and it leads to death. You remember his back was shredded because of scourging. His internal organs, his tissues were all showing. And in order to push up to get some breath of air, how painful it must have been rubbing against that rough timber of the cross. We talked about the ignorant wickedness. Let us look at verse 38 and talk about the knowing wickedness. In verse 38, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Another way to shame Christ is to put Jesus in the middle of these two robbers. Remember, they released Barabbas, and very possibly Barabbas should have been in that middle position. But putting Christ in the middle is giving him more shame. They put him in the middle, intended for Barabbas, perhaps. These robbers that killed, these robbers were not just petty robbers. They killed. They didn't sneak in, take things, and quietly leave. They barged in, blazing guns and all. They just marched in. They killed for what they wanted. They come thundering through, guns blazing. Don't sneak they killed. And these two robbers, these bandits, they were on either side of Jesus. They had knowledge of Jesus, and they are people like today, knowing Jesus. But yet, life is all about material things. They have little regard for righteousness. They have little regard for truth. Many people in the world today are like that. They know about Jesus. They are wicked nevertheless. They have a greater love for the things of the world than they do for the things of God. They're called knowing wickedness. Maybe some of you sitting here today, you know about Jesus, but you're wicked just the same. Then there are the third type of people, the fickle wicked. Look at verses 39 and 40. And those who pass by wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. These were pass buyers. They were just passing by. They were fickle. You remember just five days earlier, shouted, Hosanna, you are the king. You are going to deliver us. They gave him the red carpet treatment, and five days later, they are now just fickle. They turned they are on the other side. Crucify him. Crucify him. My, how fickle we are. How fickle we too can be. One of the questions that we have posed for your discussions today, how fickle are you in serving the Lord? One moment you're fired up for God. You're passionate. Then you become so cold, so fickle. One moment you are into God and all that he stands for. Next moment you are complaining. You are questioning. You're doubting. Even the very existence of God himself. Now just the victim of a Roman crucifixion. They who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They're the ones now recognizing Jesus to be just a victim of a Roman crucifixion. They continued mocking, and they continued to taunt, wagged their heads. They shook their heads, laughing. They said, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, come down from the cross. Jesus meant Destroy this temple of the body, and I will rebuild it in three days. I will resurrect in three days. He was referring to his body, that he was going to be crucified. Crucify me. Go ahead and kill me. I will rise again. But they took his words out of context, and they said, If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross, then we will believe. As I shared with you briefly last Sunday, Many people today are saying, if you would only do this, if I can only see you doing this, I will believe. If you would heal my mother, if you would allow my relationship to go better, if you would have me get a better job, so on and so forth, millions of things. 
If you would only do this, I would believe that you are truly the Son of God. You say you are the Son of God. Why don't you save yourself? You saved everyone else. You saved everyone else. Why can't you save yourself? If you claim to be the Messiah, come down from that cross, then we will believe. Even if he were to come down, brothers and sisters, people would have still, still not believe. Jesus did not come down from the cross, not because he couldn't come down, because he wouldn't come down. Do you realize that had Jesus come down from the cross, he wouldn't be able to say, it is finished. And if it is not a finished work, if it is not finished, you and I would have no business sitting here worshiping Christ because our destiny would be hell. We would not have any hope of eternal life. We would have no hope of heaven if Jesus were to come down from that cross. People do not realize what they're asking. Come down from the cross. They do not realize they're asking for God's wrath and his judgment. Had Jesus come down, nobody would be able to enter heaven. Jesus had to have finished the dying process, knowing that it is only through his substitutionary death that humanity would be saved. It is only because of his dying that you and I have hope of living. You and I now have eternal life. You and I now look forward to going to heaven because Christ refused to come down. It wasn't that he wasn't able to come down. People are so ignorant. When people mock Christ, when they say things about Christ, in my opinion, they are just so foolish and ignorant. They do not know what they're asking. And that is exactly why when Jesus was on the cross, it's one of the last dying words he said was, Father. In fact, his very first, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. People are so fickle. They're only interested in Jesus as an immediate satisfaction. If Jesus does not meet my immediate satisfaction, I want to meet a girl. I want to go to Jesus. I don't find a girl. Ah, he's not good enough. I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for some work. I'm looking for some food. I'm looking for some satisfaction, some encouragement. If I don't get it, I'm gone. Only interested in their immediate satisfaction Tremendous amount of responsibility is given or required from someone who knows Jesus. Those of you who have heard the gospel, those of you who know about Jesus, who know Jesus intimately, and if you were to walk away from him, there's going to be required of you a tremendous, tremendous responsibility on your part. Knowing Jesus means that you need to give your heart to him, serve him with all you have. You should never simply walk away after hearing the gospel, realizing who he is. Some of you know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You know that he's the one who heals. You know that nothing is impossible with Jesus. You know that he was, is, and is to come. You know that he's the King of kings. You know that he's the Lord of lords. Why would you ever walk away from him? Knowing the truth. Do not become like one of the fickle, wicked people. And finally, the religious wicked in verses 41 to 43. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. These religious leaders were insincere hypocritical, parading their piosity, looking religious only on the outside, appear to represent God. Oh, what tremendous judgment these religious leaders will have to face. The judgment of God, the wrath of God. You wouldn't want to be near it. You wouldn't want to be near an earthquake. You wouldn't want to be near a flood. You wouldn't want to be near a tsunami. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near a volcano. You wouldn't want to be near any of these natural disasters. But trust me, when God unleashes his fury, his wrath, it would be 
unlike anything that humanity has ever experienced. It is quite interesting to me that in the Bible, when the Old Testament people, in the time of Noah, when there was this great flood, when Noah the preacher preached for 120 years, saying there's going to be rain and there's going to be flood, and unless you come into the ark that I'm building, you will all drown. People, of course, have never seen rain, so they never believed in him, and they all drowned. The world drowned except for eight people. And the Bible says that God will never, never judge the world by water. So we think, yeah, great, there's going to be no more flood. But in the end, what is interesting to me is that when we come to the New Testament, our God, the same God who judged the world by flood in the Old Testament, he's going to judge the world by fire. You wouldn't ever want to be near that. God's fiery judgment is going to come upon the earth. Why is that? How can a good God give this kind of scary judgment? To that we say, our God is not only loving, he is a just God. There's no way that he's going to allow the wickedness that have been culminating from history, all throughout history, all the evil, all that people have done to his only begotten son. There's just no way that our holy God, righteous God, will allow these wickedness to simply go without punishment. The only way that you will be exempted from God's punishment is through Jesus Christ when you put your faith and hope in him. Say, Jesus, you are my salvation. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. There's no way that I can save myself. For those of you who have been ignorantly been cursing at God, who have been fickle, you have been wicked without really meaning to, you need to ask God for forgiveness because, again, your unknowing, your ignorance will not exempt you from the judgment of God. I want you to say, Lord, please forgive me. I did not know what I was doing. I now give my life to you. Use my life any way you want. Because you have died for me, I want to live for you from this minute on. I have so many things I need to work on. My marriage, my relationship, my job, my temper, my, my mouth, my filthiness, the sins in my life. I sin with my hands. I touch things I shouldn't touch. I say things I shouldn't say. With my body, I sin. With my mind, I sin even more. My mind travels to the edge of the universe and back. I sin so much. I want to kill people. I want to swear. I want to lie. I want to cheat. I do all these things because if I were to do these things, people will look at me as being evil, so I only sin in my mind. And that's the way we do it. You say people do not commit adultery. We have lustful thoughts with our minds all the time without ever, ever going out and doing something about it. You see a beautiful man, beautiful woman, a girl, a boy. You sin with your mind. You do not dare go and do something with your thoughts because you would probably be in jail if, you were to demonstrate and do what your mind is thinking to do. You want to steal something. You covet. You do all these things in your mind. God does not retaliate. He does not pay evil for evil. Thank God that our God is not like us. He forgives us. He is so loving at the same time, he is a just God. If you are outside of Christ, all that you have sinned, knowingly, unknowingly, all the sins you have ever committed, you will be held accountable for everything that you have said and everything that you have done. The only remedy to this condition, the sin, is if you wear the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ, all the pain, suffering that Jesus Christ has bore, if you will simply take him at his word and say, Lord Jesus, you are my salvation. You are my king. You are my Lord. Take my life. Give me eternal life. I trade in my filth for your righteousness. I have a car that's barely running. 
if somebody offered to me $50,000 for that car, even though I'm so fond of it, I eat in the car, sometimes I take a nap in the car. As you all do, your car is your best friend. It's a beautiful thing to have. But if somebody offered me $50,000 for it, in a second I would say, give that to me. You multiply that by exponential amount. You want to exchange your filthy, sinful life, your body, your mind, this deteriorating self, this outer, this thing that we have, for eternal life, living with God for all eternity, with glorified bodies. Shouldn't you exchange? Make that exchange. Make that exchange. It is well worth it. You would be a foolish person if you were to give up this offer. Jesus giving this invitation. I will take your filth and I will exchange it. I will replace it with my righteousness, my perfectness. For those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, Christ's righteousness is your righteousness. Christ's holiness is your holiness. You are who Christ is. Unbelievable. Our God, the Father, has given that to all of us because of what Christ, his Son, has done on the cross. Even though people have done ignorantly, laughing at him, doing all kinds of evil to him, Jesus, in the end, said, it is now finished. And we shall see in a couple of weeks, he breathed his last and gives up his spirit. To you, Father, I give you my spirit. In the meantime, receive the word of God seriously and discuss it in your small groups. How fickle we must be. How fickle are we in serving the Lord? Do we sin more ignorantly, not knowing, or do we willfully sin? Discuss some of these things in your small groups, and may God richly, richly bless you. Amen. Oh, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say.